seems that Maple's been overlooked for a flat top guitar tone wood for a lot of years. I would say probably because of the sound that people think of it more than anything else. Yeah, what, uh, what guitar makers typically have done in the past was we would take a design that we had intended for a rosewood guitar or a mahogany guitar, we'd take the rosewood or the mahogany off and we'd put maple in its place and expect it to sound the way we want a flat top guitar to sound. And that just, that just isn't fair. So how does it sound? It's typically too, really bright. Really bright. Typically that's the thing. real bright with a real short decay. Mm -hmm. And that's not the, like the warm, rich response that we want out of a flat top guitar. Plus it's blonde, it's sunburst, it's red. And people like yeah. brown, brown guitars. Oftentimes <laughs> we, we like brown guitars. Really? Um, so it, it has been overlooked that way. Rosewood and mahogany have been the two big ones. Those are your staple woods. But we really work to change that. It started with the ways that we worked on changing that was number one, we made it brown <laughs> because we wanted it to be brown. Like a violin. Yeah, like a violin. But physically, we also took a page out of the violin making books. You know, I was drawing on my, my experience as an arch top guitar builder or building mandolins or things. Which are always made out of maple. Those are always maple. Never rosewood. Never rosewood, never mahogany. The whole bowed instrument world has used nothing but spruce and maple for centuries now. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I took some of the, some of the uh, arch top inspired designs and approached the back and sides of a maple flat top guitar in a real similar way. So yeah. it's a different bracing scheme different glues. For instance, your back braces are at an angle and they don't reach the edge. Yeah, exactly. So it's almost like that recurve in a violin. It lets everything vibrate more. That's exactly the principle. Mm -hmm. That's why for the, I believe the first time, the back braces on these guitars don't extend all the way to the rim of the instrument. Yeah. What does that do to the strength? Nothing really. No, what I wanted was a more stiff center portion mm -hmm. with a slightly more flexible rim to give a different ring mode you know, the braces are there to support the back and they're there to cause it to move in the way you want, but it's not like they're holding it onto the sides. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. When I was designing these guitars, I like to think of the design as a recipe. It's not one single feature that can be called out. Yeah. It's, a, it's a cohesive whole. It's, it's everything an instrument. put together. Yeah, when How I, does it all work together? Yeah, when I play the guitar, I don't play a maple back. No. I don't play a spruce top. I play the whole guitar. Right, so the top bracing has something to do with yeah, it. Yeah, the top bracing, the, the thickness, back, the thickness of the woods, the, the way that you bracing, dried the wood, the way that the wood is new dried. drying methods. Yep. Mm -hmm. Torfaction on the top. Mm -hmm. I'm roasting the the Sitka spruce for these tops to give it a certain look and a certain response. It's a mild roast. Yeah, yeah. In the world of like a breakfast roast. <laughs> yeah, just like a <laughs> breakfast roast. I'm yeah. more of an espresso guy, but you know. It works. It all adds up, it yeah. really does. The glues, the ultra, ultra thin finish, yeah. all of those things, they're all elements that go into the recipe of this particular instrument. The thin finish is huge. It's just big, uh, a big contributor to how good a guitar can sound in general. And on this guitar, it made a big difference. And literally the finish on this guitar is half the thickness of what most good guitar finishes are. And that lets a lot of sound through because yeah. finish Material is the enemy of sound, it really is. It's a lot of mass, it's no strength, it doesn't add anything structurally. So uh, we, we borrowed from the 800s on that, putting mm -hmm. a really thin finish on this guitar. In this case, made even more difficult by this hand rubbed stain. Because mm -hmm. again, we wanted the guitar to be brown and real appealing like an old violin. But yeah. boy, that combination is almost impossible to pull off. Well, typically the color on maple is done in the varnish itself. And so to get that Typically, same yeah. color, we had to stain the wood so that we didn't build up finished thickness because we can't do a varnish thickness. Right? Yeah. And staining the wood this color is actually hard, but you figured it out and I'm proud of you for that. Most players, when they pick up this instrument, what they're gonna hear is a good flat top guitar. You're going to hear the characteristic of maple, which is its real consistent character. It's like a, there's a linear kind of response to where every note has a real similar color, real even sound pressure. It's a real balanced guitar. But it actually does, changes with you more than other guitars do. Yeah, what's interesting is maple by itself, unlike rosewoods or mahoganies, 
it's real personalities that it doesn't sound like any one thing in particular. It becomes very player reflective. So if I play the guitar warmly, it's a very warm guitar. If I play it real forcefully, it's a loud, bright guitar. Mm -hmm. So it changes depending on who picks it up, how that person plays. At but the, still, you know, still you strum that thing, just one E chord, and you're like, oh my gosh, I've never heard bass response and clarity of notes and depth in a maple guitar like that ever. It's the first time anybody will remember hearing that kind of depth on a maple guitar. Yeah. And so the things that you're talking about, it moving with the player, that, that is its sort of transparent nature. It's, it's not so mapley, you know what I mean? It's, not, it's, it's more uh, neutral than a mahogany guitar, a rosewood guitar, but still, no matter who plays it, they're gonna hear depth in that and that That's... guitar and volume in that guitar that they've never heard. They'll, you know, because of the brown color and its sound, you can put this in the player, in the hands of players, and they'll play it for 30 minutes and go, what is, what is this guitar? This guitar is incredible. Well, it's maple, you know. Yeah. Whoa, I've never heard a maple guitar. It's like a that. real interesting thing because it has this linear, very player reflective quality, but that's in the context of what we want to, to think of as a flat top guitar sound. We want mm -hmm. it to be a gratifying experience. Yeah. And for a lot of players, this is a very appealing kind of guitar to strum those big E chords. It's more than appealing, it's disruptive. People always ask us, you know, when we come out with something, people will go, is it, is it, are we going to use it more? Is it going to expand more? Are we going to do more things? Well, we're always exploring. So, you know, we, we've got six or so models in the 600 series um, that are Maple. Um, certainly Maple will find its way to other guitars. Um, we've made some GS Minis with beautiful Maple on it before, and, and that, was, that was pretty fun. But we'll, we'll find ourselves using Maple in, in other guitars. We can't say what yet because we haven't been inspired in that direction, but we're always playing around. And you know, part of this whole idea of maple is to use this wood. You know, this is, it's, it's not, it's a symbiotic thing between yeah. making the guitar and having wood that's grown in the United States. Exactly, the reason that we pursued this, redesigning this guitar in the first place is when we look forward 20, 30 years from now, we realize, well, the maple forests are in good condition. This is a wood that's growing here in North America. We're, 20 years from now, we're gonna see more maple. And that means we're gonna see more maple guitars. And so we wanted to change what people thought of maple and its unique tone profile so that in the future, hey, this is inevitable. We're gonna build more maple guitars. That's what's coming. I have to say that the main reason that we're gonna see more maple in the future is because of one man named Steve McMinn who has taken it upon himself to cultivate the maple, both at a forest level and even on a plantation level. And because of his willingness to do that, we came in to support behind. And so now we're supporting each other. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fact is, is left to its own devices, the maple would get all cut down too. But we're here in the US with people who are willing to, to cultivate and care for this wood. And uh, we love, we love wood that's being grown here, right? And here. we love Steve. And we love Steve. <laughs> in reality, a tropical wood forest has 100 species in a square mile, and a North American temperate forest has five species in a square mile. So there is such thing as a cherry wood forest or an oak forest, but that doesn't happen with rosewood, mahogany, um, ebony. things like ebony, things like that. Um, so the realities are that these forests have been cut for centuries and there's more people using more of them so there's two realities the, the the negative reality is this wood has been all but cut and you have to go deeper and deeper to get it in places that are stressed where the the population is stressed it's third world it's poor on the other hand um, there are places where people are starting to get themselves organized small communities in Honduras a community logging in Guatemala where they're looking at the sustainability of it. I say one mahogany tree per acre. I mean one you could harvest. There's another one coming up behind it that 30 years from now you can harvest again. There's mahogany planted in Fiji that the British planted 100, well, 85 years ago. Um, so we're, we're at this point right now, a real tipping point where 
if you make one wrong move, you could ruin the whole entire future. And uh, if we slow down, get more cautious, more ethical about what we're doing, the traditional woods could be sustainable. Um, this is one reason why maple is so important to mm -hmm. us because we can grow that here. We really don't want to depend on equatorial countries uh, to supply our woods forever and just consume them with abandon. In Cameroon, uh, ebony grows and it's really the, one of the last viable places on earth where, where there's forests left, where there's a lot of ebony trees, where it's legal mm -hmm. uh, to cut. Um, legal is one thing, ethical, moral is another thing. So we partnered with a guitar wood supply company that has that we've done business with for 20 years called Medinter in Spain and and together the both of us uh, own an ebony mill in Africa and one of the reasons that we did that actually the main reason was to have our own very personal knowledge that the cutting of the wood was done correctly and ethically and legally um, it's so important that that's done that the that there is a sustainability component to what we're doing there. So by taking that over uh, for ourselves, we're able to not only supply Taylor with wood, but we're able to supply uh, the musical in industry, a broader, even guitars and violin, bowed instruments, we can supply ebony to that, that, uh, that we know has, has been done properly. And one of the things that Taylor Guitars has done is to use the ebony that's not pure black, which was typically left behind. Yeah, I mean, all your building life and for 200 years before that, only the pure black piece would was, be used. Was used for the high-end instruments. Yeah, but we use, um, we use the ebony throughout our whole line that's, that's got the, what in days gone past would have been called discoloration, but we just call it coloration because it's beautiful. And we find that our clients yeah. love it. When you think about tone wood sourcing, what's next? Um, I'm gonna say growing wood, that's what's next. And typically, in years gone by, the answer would be, well, we found a wood that grows here or there. And that's know, the new exotic thing to be excited the, about. And you go and you take it until there's nothing left. No, the next, um, the next big thing is growing wood. We really have to, and, and does that mean plantations, straight rows? Yeah, it could mean that. Does it mean uh, finding a patch of forest that you buy and then you, you do forestry work to it to where you're taking, you're, it's just a natural forest, but you're taking wood out at a sustainable level? That's true too. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's the next thing. And it can happen with us in our own private or, or uh, endeavors that we do, but I believe we'll see it happening on a, on a um, community level in countries that have valuable wood. Yeah, in a lot of ways it's like farm to table guitar making mm -hmm. where rather than just going and looking for the natural resource and then taking that away and going and making your beautiful instrument out of it, you're building an instrument knowing full well what the forest is like, knowing full well that this tree was harvested specifically to build instruments with. It was grown specifically to build instruments with. You know, so in that way, that's what I see as the future of guitar making is intentionally building an instrument. And that means from the time you first plant a seed. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a long-term uh, return on investment because a lot of the trees, uh, let's take koa wood in Hawaii, for example. You, you, you cut down a, a hundred-year-old tree, but with some forest tending, some pruning and some selection and some removal, you can get there in, you can get to that same 100 year old tree in 40 years because the forest has to fight to survive and so a tree becomes an old gnarly grandpa through fighting. But we can help it along without it being literally a plantation of carrots, you know, all in a, in a row. It's still mm -hmm. forest habitat. And uh, to me, that's the future. It really is the only viable future is sustainable forest operations, whether they're private or community or government, sustainable forestry is the only answer. And that's a way better answer to me than synthetic materials on the guitar. Absolutely. Yeah. I try new combinations of tone woods from time to time. 
things that, you know, I'll see one example, one specimen, and become excited about it. And the reality is that I come back to the traditional instrument making woods because, well, let's face it, several hundred years of instrument making tradition have narrowed down what woods you really enjoy working with, what work best for an instrument. And so in that way, the thing that I'm most excited about is looking at the sustainable forestry models of these traditional woods. Maybe even giving a new voice to a traditional wood, mm -hmm. making a new design out of a traditional wood. Like, are, we, like you did with maple. Yeah, there's unique properties in every wood. Some of them work really well for, say, making a canoe. Others are guitar wood. And so I'm interested in building good guitars out of guitar wood. We've got to make it here. We've got to make it here with what we have. And, and let's say, for example, you did find a wood that was the, the new thing that no one ever heard about. Well, first, there's no such thing uh, as that. We know every True. wood that, that grows. We really do. Yeah. Um, there's no part of the world left um, that has something that's really desirable. But in the end, you can't really get wood unless there's a road to it, unless there's electricity to, you know, mill it on site, unless there's a shipping port to ship it, you know. So when you think about the practicalities of it, there's, it's, it's not just a, an issue of discovering a wood that we're excited mm -hmm. about. We are excited about black wood, but it comes from a first world country, mm -hmm. and there's a road to go get it, and we can take down trees off of Farm farmland, land. things like that, you know, old private tree without actually digging into the forest. So um, that's a little primer on how guitar woods get to us. They can't get to us without a truck, a road, a ship, and all of that has to be available to find a wood. And so every place there is a truck, a road, and a ship, we already know what wood is there. The one bit of advice that I would give to someone who's interested in building instruments is to start. It sounds <laughs> that's what I'd say too. <laughs> it sounds overly simple, but unless you start somewhere, you won't actually do it. You could learn all there is to learn about something, but until you're actually doing it, cutting into a piece of wood, gluing pieces of wood together, you can't actually make something. So the best bit of advice I can offer is to simply start somewhere. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. It sure is. And I'll, I'll just, you, that's what I'd say to an aspiring guitar player. That's what I would say to an artist, a cook, a writer, anybody. You, you have to start. And it's funny because a lot of times people come up to me and they'll say, I want to build guitars. And I'll say, well, okay, then build one. Well, what do I do? Okay, get a book, get some wood. Well, what if I make it bad? You know, well, make a bad one and then make a, another bad one and just keep doing it until they get good. It really is no um, harder than that. And we do live in a day where you can go on YouTube and watch in detail how to do it. It's just amazing. Um, the materials and the know-how that's available. Dive in, it could be one of the most fun things you've ever done. And it's, I'll tell you what, when you finish that first guitar that you made and you play it, it doesn't matter how bad it turns out, it's the most rewarding thing that a woodworker can do. Do it. Yeah.